Hi, everyone out there. If you can hear me, uh, please uh, just say hi. Tell me where you are um, calling in from or Zooming in from. It's not a Zoom call. It's a YouTube Live. Anyways, um, I'm in Hamilton, Montana. All right. Hi, Julie. Hi, Roberta. Is that Snelling, California? Hi, Beth. Tampa, Florida. Awesome, you guys. Thanks for joining me. It's, it's so nice not to feel so lonely in my studio. I wonder if you guys feel lonely. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Hi, DJ. You're in Bozeman. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Amanda. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for joining me. Wow, Karen in Cape Town. That's far away. Hope you're all doing well. And uh, I changed my backdrop here. It's a different painting. And <laughs> I actually might have figured out how to do a better YouTube Live in the future, but uh, I almost had it ready for today. But uh, I need a little bit more practice. So if you guys are open to me practicing on you next time, I'm going to try and turn my Surface Pro down toward my table so I can actually do a demo um, either on my table or on a wall. So if you guys are open to me experimenting with you guys being the guinea pigs because I never know how it's going to really turn out. Um, if you're okay with that, then that'd be awesome. Hi, Judy. Hi, Nell. Oh, very nice. From Brittany, France. And uh, Linda Wilcott, hello from Canada. And Julie Coleman from Atlanta. Wow. Thank you guys for joining me. I don't feel so alone anymore. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, I, I know last time I just kind of uh, jabbered away, and I, I didn't really mean to do that, but I'm not used to these YouTube Lives at all. And um, so to keep me more on track, I want to uh, answer some questions that you guys submitted between uh, a couple days ago and today. And just so you know, below this live video, there should be a link where you guys can uh, submit other questions so that if you want me to do these live Q&As, I'm more than happy to. They're really fun for me, and I learn a lot by doing them. So, um, number one, I'm, my name is Pam Coey, um, if you didn't know that, and this is my channel, so you probably know that. But anyways, I'm in my studio. I have my schnauzer here, just one of them, and I hope you're all doing well and staying safe. Um, so I wanted to um, just, uh, yeah, please continue to tell me where you guys are from and you guys can see each other, hopefully, and who's on the call. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So um, Linda Perry had a uh, question um, from Berlin, Maryland, and I wanted to um, talk about this one. She asked, when do you stop and how much time do you put into a piece? Uh, now, any of you can also, like, respond to the question. It's not just me answering this so that um, if Linda happens to be on this call or if she sees it in the um, as the recorded live call, um, she can read everybody's comments. So like when do you stop and how much time do you put into a piece? Um, I would say that, Linda, that really varies for me. I don't know about you, but for me, um, I, I do feel like when I'm painting, I'm in a conversation with the artwork. And I kind of, it's like a back and forth conversation. And in the beginning, you know, I, I'm trying to not be judgmental. And I'm trying to be like critical of myself. And I'm just trying to have joy when I paint early on. Now, um, that then transitions into the next phase where I do start to think a little bit more. Things are more intentional. And then, of course, the, the experimentation and things that I do in that stage leads me to things happening that I start to recognize. So I'm always on the lookout for things that might catch my attention. And the things that catch my attention are things that I really care for. So I have to be on the lookout at all times. And it's not just like the, the left side of my painting. It's the right side of my painting. It's the top of my painting. It's like the whole thing. So I stand back a lot, you know, and let's just say that I start to develop the painting. So I, I really can't tell you that there's any specific time. I, I think it varies. It can be anywhere from, you know, I'm, I think that a painting can be finished in a half an hour if you kind of luck out. And it also depends on how spontaneous you want it to be. A lot of my more recent work I'm allowing to remain more spontaneous because I think that's just, well, before the pandemic, that's kind of how I was feeling. Now, to be honest, I haven't had a chance to really come in here and 
get back into the work. There's been a lot of things. Um, we've got family visiting, and I'm sure you guys have a lot going on right now. But um, that's why I wanted to do these lives, because I want to stay connected and make sure that everybody's okay out there and uh, connect with you. So it's a great question, Linda, but I have to say that it varies. Um, there is no right or wrong, and it also depends on the medium. Um, and it also would depend on, like, if, if I were not a non-objective artist and I was a more representational artist, you know, if you're highly representational, even like photo representational, that is going to take you a long, long time. So from my vantage point, I'd have to say it, it varies a whole lot, and I don't think there's any right or wrong. Um, Pat Froze from the Netherlands asked to allow myself to follow my intuition, even if it is making something totally different. Um, I think she's asking, like, how do you how do you allow yourself to follow your own intuition? And um, that's also a really good question. Um, yeah, your intuition is kind of your gut feeling, and it it also is a compilation, I think, of everything you've encountered over your lifetime. The longer you paint and the longer you live, I think there's a lot more information to pull from. So when you're painting, and again, I, I can only speak about my own way of painting, which if you can see the painting behind me, this is called non-objective, and I'm I'm focusing on things that I care about right now, which are the design elements. I'm I'm fascinated by that, and I I clearly think that these are things from the internal world. My internal world, they're not from my environment. This painting behind me does not look like Montana, <laughs> and so um, following your own intuition, I think what that takes is trying to block out the noise from outside of your head. So input from other people, advice from other people, comments from other people. In order to follow your own intuition, um, I think there's a level of honesty that's really important. And it's it's not easy to get there because there's so much noise coming from the audience. So I would protect that. I would say that if especially for new artists, like though it's tempting to ask for other people's opinion, you're very vulnerable and kind of delicate at that stage if you're just starting to paint. And I would just avoid asking too many people what they think. It's more what you think. And the more you can start to just wrap your head around what you think, um, granted, that took me easily 20 years to do. So I'm not saying that that is easy at all. Uh, we all kind of want to know. But your own intuition, it's, um, it is, it, I can't explain it any more than saying that it is a gut feeling. And I think we all know what that means. And a lot of times when we're not happy with something, we wish that we could find somebody, anybody, a neighbor, a friend, our spouse, our pet, um, that would just say how much they love it because in a way that would compensate for us feeling kind of sad about our painting. But in the end, that doesn't really take away the fact that we're sad. And we need to let ourselves be sad because part of being sad is recognizing that what we have in front of us is not fulfilling us and that will spur you on to continue that journey and just just embrace it so great question I'm not sure if I answered that um, Ronnie Castell from New York and um, she is in my uh, watch learning girl and the uh, powerful design and personal color course and she wants to know you know how do you break the mold and I, I read that and I thought hmm you know, that's a great question, and I, I thought about it, and I thought to myself, if you want to break the mold of, like, you know, you're you're this, but you want to kind of go here just for the experience of going there. It's like, I live in Montana. I want to go to the Netherlands just for the experience of being there. Well, obviously, if I'm traveling, that I know I need to get a plane ticket and get there, but in your studio, if you are here and you want to get here, uh, I would kind of look at maybe five paintings that you're pretty happy with. And uh, again, I'm, I'm very much, uh, I guess my left brain kind of kicks in when I start to think about these questions because how do you know where you are unless you analyze? And I, I know that word analyze is probably like the worst thing you can say in the art world, but um, you can break your paintings down into the design elements. So again, if you are in my course, you know what that means. If you if you have a good base in color and design, you know what that means. And if you don't, then I think you're you owe it to yourself to find that out. 
Um, but we have design elements, and they're kind of like our alphabet. So if you speak English, we have our alphabet. If you speak another language, you have your vocabulary. Um, based on these elements, you can look at your work, and maybe you like more curvilinear lines. Maybe you like more warm colors. Maybe you like mid-tone paintings. Uh, maybe you like um, calm, vertical lines in your work. Whatever it is that you've been doing in those five paintings that you've chosen, on the other side, in your notebook, in your sketchbook, in your journal, what is the opposite of that? So if you've been doing a lot of warm paintings, if you want to break the mold and go cool, go cool. If you want to break the mold and you've been curvilinear, go rectilinear. If you've been doing things that are calm with these vertical lines or horizontal lines, you know, like calm, that's what these lines do. Um, go with high energy, go with directionality, go with the diagonal. So. Uh, my answer to breaking the mold is to look at uh, what you've done and then don't do it. Uh, whatever your favorite fallback colors are, challenge yourself and say, I'm not going to use those. And I did do that at the very end of my 20, 50, maybe 15 years of doing watercolor. I had my go-to colors. I always used French ultramarine blue and alizarin crimson because they they go well together. They make a beautiful purple. They sediment into the paper, and you can rock the paper, and it goes into these little wells in the paper, and it was just, you know, I couldn't get away from that. So finally, when I got to the end of that phase, I was like, okay, I am going to, uh, I'm going to not use cool colors because the alizarin crimson is a cool red, and the blue is kind of, um, it's a blue with red in it, so it's kind of leaning toward warm. And I thought, okay, I'm going to do a warm painting, and I'm telling you, that is the last painting I did before I hung up my watercolor brushes. Uh, and it is actually one of my favorite paintings. So there is something to break in the mold. And I think that is a really great question. Um, like, how would I have known what these warm colors could offer me if I hadn't, like, known and recognized that my go-to colors were these cool colors? So, Ronnie, I think that's an important question. And I really feel like we all need to break the mold. Uh, at any time. And that really shakes things up. You're so disoriented. It's like, literally, uh, you're almost speaking another language again, because it's a whole new thing that you can learn. So anything that you can change is going to encourage you to learn more. And I think that's a good thing in our studio. Now, um, Elle in Australia, she writes, uh, I'm painting semi-abstract landscapes, lake shapes. Initially, I have a strong concept of my composition. And over time, usually halfway through, I love some part of the painting so much that it paralyzes me, and I'm unable to resolve the problems of other areas. It would require changes to the part I love, and I'm getting stuck protecting the one part of my painting. How do I overcome the fear of change, and how do I progress without changing my initial concept of composition and design? Is that the challenge that you're talking about? I bet that like most of you that are uh, tuning in, if, if you can relate to that question, like if you've had a hard time covering up something that you loved, you loved it so much that it was like, I got to stay away from that area. I'm going to work anywhere else but there. Um, how did that work out for you? Did that work out okay? Because in my experience, that's a disaster. Um, so I think timing is pretty important in answer to Elle's question. You know, if, if you're trying to avoid an area because you love it, but everything around it is kind of a catastrophe and it, it's not working, the area that you love, you have to really ask yourself, is it occurring too early in the painting process? Is it in the right place? Is it in a good location? You know, it's kind of like real estate, you know, that location, location, location. If it were smack dab in the middle of your painting, I would say, yeah, you could make that work. Um, that would be a bigger challenge than if it were in a different area of your painting. And we have to be a little careful. If we're in the play stage, you know, the idea is play. And we can't help ourselves but be on the lookout for things that we love. So if you're, you know, she, it sounds like she has a style that, you know, she has kind of a preconceived idea. She might be working plein air. She might have a sketch. So regardless, um, we're, Regardless of the, our genre that we're painting in, we're going to have these favorite areas that pop up along the painting process. The question of whether we keep them or lose them and then have the courage to cover them, I think depends on a skill level, an experience level. Um, the less experience you have, 
I think the more we, we want to keep things that we're worried that we just can't do it again, it's that fear that you can't reproduce something. And I would, my challenge for anybody who has that fear of not wanting to cover up something they love would be to, to grab 10 panels, paper, whatever it is, whatever support, whatever medium, it doesn't even matter. And the only thing you have to do is create and, um, and create things you love so that you can practice covering them up. It's going to get easier if you get used to covering things and losing things that you love and building your confidence that you know you can do it again. Granted, that thing that you create later is not going to be the identical thing that you just covered up, but you have to convince yourself that creativity is like a, it's like a free-flowing spring that never dries out. Um, you got to believe and trust in your own creativity that it, it doesn't have an end. It's perpetual, and you, you want to encourage that. But the only way you're ever going to get to that point, which, believe me, that is hard to do. I, I'm not trying to make it seem like it's easy. Um, and I, I guess sometimes I probably do, but um, I would be the first one to admit that it's really, really hard to do that. But the better, is, is, again, it's like the, the more times you cover things that you love, and I would just make that your goal, like aim for things you love in your painting, and then just like tell yourself, the minute I see something I love, I'm going to cover it up. And then keep going, create something else you love, cover it up. Keep going, create something you love, cover it up. That pra practice Again, art, uh, there are a lot of things in art that, you know, yeah, you can have talent, but I don't really believe in talent. You have not read that book. Um, she did her PhD thesis on um, basically these upside-down drawings. So I don't know how many of you out there have read that book or done these upside-down drawings, but when I taught 2D color and design and drawing, I guess mostly drawing, I guess fundamentals and drawing, um, I had a lot of like business majors and um, they would come in there kind of petrified. And I can't draw a straight line. I can't draw a stick, a stick figure. And my job then was to convince them that, well, why would you want to draw a straight line in the first place? You have a ruler. And what's wrong with the stick figure? There's nothing wrong with the stick figure. But beyond that, drawing is a learned skill. Um, Betty Edwards in her book says that it's very much like learning how to drive. So if you don't think you can draw, um, print out, find, go Google something online that says Master Drawing by Michelangelo or um, Picasso or Matisse, you know, somebody who like, you, it has to be somebody who you can get a line drawing. Turn it upside down and then um, uh, draw it and, you know, look at the quadrant, look at the relationship between the line and the corners and between the lines. When something's upside down, you knock out the left side of your brain and the right side of your brain kicks in. So if you can learn how to draw, then um, you can also learn how to create art. And the secret then is, um, yeah, there's a lot of intuition. It does require creativity, but I don't think it, it's not about talent. So I'm going off on a tangent again. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I don't even know if I answered the question. So let's see here. Ah, uh, okay. Um, Evie, Evie uh, from Denmark says, I can combine different mediums. This is not the problem. The problem is that I want to say so many things in every painting. I also want to say so many different things by creating many different paintings. I end up making many different works that have some connection in style, but still look like they are made by different artists. Yeah, I, I can relate to that as well. Um, I've been there. And... So um, Evie or Evie in Denmark, dressed in, uh, let's see, uh, pattern, you know, um, which has to do with texture. Pattern is a kind of texture. So you might want to, like, write down all these areas that you're interested in and then devote a series of work to each one. Instead of saying, I'm going to do one painting that is this idea and one painting that is this idea and keep going one painting, one painting, you're going to look like, if you had 16 ideas, you're going to have like 16 styles. What you really want is that first idea, do a series of eight paintings. The second idea, do another series of eight paintings. Because whatever series, whatever, you have to exhaust an idea and you have to create themes and variations on a the theme. And you want to like, the reason you had the idea, it's a great thought, but 
there are so many different ways to express any one idea that I think what you're trying to do is learn more about yourself with that one idea. So you're kind of ripping yourself off if you only do it once. It takes so many different um, variations on a theme. Think about if you, if any of you are musicians and you think about um, the fugues mm-hmm. and the sonatas and the sonatinas and, you know, these, these musical composers, they have books of fugues. They have books of sonatinas because they didn't just do one. Um, that is a certain kind of rhythm. And they kept creating and they kept creating. And, you know, what about... Um, I'm trying to think of other rhythms, but I'm kind of drawing a blank. Anyway, so what you want to do is just take all of your ideas, try to categorize them, and then just just do one idea at a time, exhaust that one idea, make a series, and then move on. I guess that would be um, my recommendation. Um, Somebody asked about the Strathmore paper that I attached to wood. Uh, That actually is um, not what this is behind me. What is behind me is a different kind of paper. This is Archie's oil paper, but the method is the very same. And um, I wanted to just mention that my video number 46 on YouTube talks about how I mount works on paper onto panel. So it's video 46. I finally have them numbered, so you can easily find it. And then um, Scott, I sent a question this morning. He says he has limited experience, therefore still building tools, techniques, color palette. And he says, you know, lack of connection to an art community mm-hmm. and mentors. He, he wants to use cold wax medium. How do you generate the dripping effect? Um, and in the last live session, he says that I mentioned my online course, which I did. Mm-hmm. And I just um, wanted to let you guys know that if any of you are interested in learning more, about the concepts that I I truly believe are really, really fundamental and you must know them in order to succeed in in your art. Um, If you go to artandsuccess.com, that's where my training website is. It's it's got a lot of offerings, um, everything from my online courses in um, Powerful Design, Personal Color, and I've got a new acrylic course, and then I just opened up a brand new library that has over 40 hours of videos in it. So I try to just... um, get as much information out in many different forms because one size doesn't fit all. And I realize a lot of you like YouTube, but there's a lot of stuff on YouTube I can't share because it's too long, it gets too detailed, it, it requires a certain amount of like understanding the, the vocabulary that we use in my course. So that kind of stuff I kind of leave out. Okay, um, any questions? I'll take a break here. Anyone have a question for me? Um, right off the bat, it looks like... Uh, Terry Cash says, I try so hard to make non-representational abstract painting, just shapes and texture. Many times I see figures or objects in abstracts. Um, I see a fish gal right now. Um, I think, let me think. Uh, yeah, she, she keeps seeing the figure. Um, she wants to be like this non-objective artist, but the figure keeps popping up. Um, I don't know. I, I think that these things that recur, they kind of recur for a reason. Um, uh, if, if you're not liking what you're seeing, if, if you're starting to see things that keep reappearing and it's just like, if that's not what you want, well, um, usually that's a shape that you're dealing with. And kind of like I had that, that thing about color where I kept going for the same color. It could be like a, formula, a formulaic habit where it's almost like memory. You know, if, if you love drawing figures or there's something about the figure that you, you just kind of automatically do it, I don't know, go, switch to your non-dominant hand and um, perhaps try that. Uh, try to um, analyze the edge quality, the lines. Is, is the figure's curvilinear? So maybe go into a rectilinear mode and say, okay, this painting is going to be mostly rectilinear. Uh, again, it's, it's do what that is not. If you're trying to break a mold, then analyze what you have and then do the opposite. And so in order to do that, you have to really like write it down. You really have to look at your paintings or your drawings and um, get a feel for what it is that you're not liking. Um, Okay, that was one question from you. Um, How do you create intention in your artwork? Hi, Jeno. (laughs) Nice to see you. Um, So how do you create intention in your artwork? Um, well, I think that intention is partly, um, a thing that happens when you, you have to know what it is that you love. You can be more intentional about the things you love, 
if you don't know what you love, then you're just like throwing mud at the wall. And I did that for a long time. I didn't, I mean, in what, do you look back to in any of our histories of art? Where did we start? We didn't know what our intention was. We didn't have a clue. We start looking around at other artwork. We start to say, I like this. I like that. I don't like this. Um, and, and all those little clues start to help us formulate what our intention is. So for me, like I had a period of my life when I was um, doing uh, florals and landscapes, got bored. Then I moved into very like heavy uh, scientific based work, which I now looking back realized that was a very important part of my history. It was a catharsis that I had to purge from my system. Very different artwork from what I'm doing now. That was very intense because that's what makes me happy and that's what the abstract expressionists did. If, you, if you're not aware of them, uh, Kandinsky is the father of abstraction and um, Pollock and um, Franz Klein and Motherwell and um, Frankenthaler and um, I'm not good at thinking up names when I'm doing a live, but anyways, uh, these are all abstract expressionists that their focus was not things. It was color, line, texture, rhythm, pattern. Um, that's what turns me on. But again, intention, that's personal. you you got to find what is going to move you. And um, <clears throat> all right, um, going back here to, I have an acrylic question here from Ron from France. And he asks, what do you use when you glaze, when you said the glaze would be wiped off and left to sink into the fissure? Like it's a very sharp pointy instrument. I gouged it. And then I took a very thin transparent acrylic like golden um, nickel azo quinacridone gold or any of the quinacridones, um, any of the golden fluid paints, um, put it onto like either a shop towel or, uh, you know, if, if your panel is flat on the table, you just pour it and you rub it around. You might dilute it with some airbrush medium. It goes into the cracks, the nooks and crannies of your, your panel or whatever, and then you just take a paper towel that's just damp with water and you, you kind of sop up all the extra glaze, and what's left then is a whisper of color that's going to go into these fissures, and it will leave um, enough of a like hint of that color so that your painting moves forward, and it tends to harmonize uh, the entire surface. So that's a really good question. Um, let's see. Um, okay, easy question here, or not easy, I mean easy answer, I should say. Um, Betty Gilmore from Yakima, Washington asked, how do you use small stencils and then clean up after them? Um, I happen to have a stencil here, and um, I don't, you know, I don't, they're not pristine, <laughs> that's for sure, but this one's been used with um, acrylic, and the my number one, uh, what I found about acrylic, it, what's great is like after it's dried and you've got all that crusty stuff on your stencils, if they're plastic, if you have hand sanitizer, which if you're if you have any right now, you're lucky because it's hard to find it. But um, so alcohol, straight alcohol or hand sanitizer, um, if you've got like a lot of acrylic even on your hand, I found that some hand sanitizer, just rub it around and all of a sudden all that alcohol comes off. And then if it was like oil paint and oil and coal wax medium, if it's a little dried on there, um, Murphy's oil soap, you can either put some of that on top of a brush or a stencil or whatever, if it can take it, put it into a Ziploc bag and let it sit for a few days and then it, it loosens up really well and it'll, it'll get that clean. Okay, um, Charlie Leniston from Florida asked, can I paint the white paper a different color when I start my first play pieces. So she's talking about a, uh, a tinted ground. Yeah, it's really wonderful. You can either buy, um, well, you don't have to buy paper that's tinted. You can buy colored gesso, different grounds, and, um, you know, warm grounds and cool grounds. Or you can take gesso and just add some color to it. You don't want to add too much, like maybe one part per five or something because the gesso is a different consistency than acrylic paint. Gesso is meant to be absorbent. So if you dilute that too much with some color, um, it's not going to be the same gesso anymore. So um, probably just be a little careful if you're coloring it um, with the ratio or buy a tinted ground. And you, know, you can Google that on Amazon or wherever and, and find a tinted ground. 
Um, this is another great question Charlie had. Um, what is the difference between Arches oil paper and say 300 gram watercolor paper? So 300 uh, weight um, watercolor paper is very, very heavy. It tends to not buckle when you work on it. So the difference between watercolor paper and say the Arches oil paper is that uh, watercolor paper is sized, meaning it has glue on it. So when you first put watercolor on it, if you didn't soak it first, um, it's going to kind of like sit on the surface and not sink into the paper. So that's different from Arches oil paper, which is actually the way that they made that. It's meant for oil and cold wax medium. So I think what you might be getting at, because I think she, she works in oil and cold wax medium, uh, what you want to do, if, if you only had watercolor paper but you wanted to work in oil and cold wax, what you would do then is you would want to gesso your watercolor paper. Um, now that, if you had 300 weight, that's kind of very expensive. So it's meant for watercolor. I would say the, you know, the best thing if you are a watercolor artist is save it for the watercolor. But if that's all you had and you're not going to do any watercolor, then just gesso over it. And then you can work in either acrylic or you can work in uh, oil and cold wax medium. It's no longer going to be as good for watercolor anymore once you've gessoed it though. And um, here's another question about mounting paper on board or canvas. Again, go back to the video 46 for how you mount on panel. As far as mounting on canvas, uh, I would say the same adhesive, which is Lineco. I use the Lineco liquid adhesive. It's um, a glue. And I would say that that would work very well with canvas too. And let's see here. There are a lot of questions about supports. Um, any other questions right now? I'm just looking down the list here. Okay. Okay, you guys, it's great. You guys are like, you have, um, you have lots of conversation going on here. Um, okay, well, I, it's hard for me to like, I, <laughs> I, I could wa read what you guys have been chatting and then get, uh, not answer any questions. So I think I'll just keep going on with this. Um, technical here. Okay, so Valerie Payne in California asked, when you work on a large-scale painting on paper and things are just not working for you, do you keep on working or crop the piece down or even use it for uh, collage pieces? And um, I don't know if I addressed that in the, I think I did address it in the last, sorry, <laughs> I probably addressed that in the very last call. But no, just so that you guys know, I don't, I try not to crop. I mean, I'm not saying that I would never do it. Uh, but that for me is like a, I, I try not to do that. Sorry, I think I already answered that last time. Um, yeah, what Rose West asked from Portland, Oregon, what color combinations would I avoid, if any? Um, no, there's nothing I wouldn't avoid. I, I'm a little careful about metallics. Um, I used to go, I went through a phase when I love metallics, and I even used like aluminum foil in some work, and um, there's that part of me that likes the bling, you know, but I think that we can kind of overdo it. So there are certain things that I think can become gimmicky if you're not careful, including collage paper. So um, we have a gal in, in one of my classes um, who is making their own. I think she is making it with, um, you know, she's doing printmaking and making her own collage. Well, there's nothing more personal than that. But uh, we have to be a little careful about store-bought stencils, store-bought collage paper, um, anything store-bought because it kind of has that look to it, you know, and and metallic papers and things like that. So um, as far as color combinations themselves, um, my challenge to myself is if there's ever a color I don't understand, like I've never used it before, there's a combination I've never tried, um, even if it's like, an, you know, maybe... Maybe, okay, let's pick a color like um, cadmium green and dioxazine purple. Now, those are not two colors I would normally put together, but I, my challenge to myself would be make it work. And uh, I, would, I would put them out of my palette, just those two colors. Um, they are both considered to be cool colors. We've got a green and a purple, but I wouldn't normally think about painting with those two colors. Um, I'd mix up my, my five piles of tone. And then I would start to experiment with mixing the colors with the grays and the colors with each other and create what I think I could absolutely find colors I love um, using any two colors or any three colors um, 
In fact, that's one of the challenges I want to do next is to grab colors almost blindly and then or colors that I don't like and and find colors that I do like. So um, I don't want to take forever here of your time. Um, I just want to thank you guys for um, being here and I'll keep it to about a half an hour so that um, but I, I just want to stay connected with you and um, I will try to announce when I do the next YouTube live um, and what I tend to do is like these YouTube lives, I'm not sure if they even like show up. So I, what I tend to do is I download it and then I do the editing and then I upload it again. So even like the one I did a few days ago, that's going to come back. It's going to disappear for a while and then come back again, but it's going to be added, like add some other things to it. So, um, but your questions are great. And if you look below this live video, there's like a place where you can submit questions. And this time I only had like six so I kind of went back into some older questions. But um, anyways, thank you all for being there. And um, I hope that you stay safe and um, isolated and wear your mask. Um, I, it's sounding like we're kind of making some progress with the virus. So um, just hope that you're doing well. And thank you again for joining me. And with that, I'll say goodbye. So everybody.